So I was reminded the other day of the quote, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. I think what you just heard right here has to be the future, um, but obviously that's not what's happening in, in the universe here yet. So I wanted to make sure to follow that up with people who are leading. And so the next group here is gonna talk about a commitment that the Kresge Foundation made to diversify its managers by 25% by the year 2025. I'm excited to welcome to the stage Rip Rapson, president of the Kresge Foundation, and Susan Taylor Batten, president of ABFI. For those of you who are waiting for Susan, because she's the real attraction, she's getting mic'd. So, here we go, Susan, yay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hey. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, uh, so Rip and I are pleased to be here to continue this important conversation around diversity and asset management. and. We, uh, this was a good setup, the, the colleagues that spoke before us, um, and we sort of set this up as um, an interview, and I'm going to talk to Rip, um, who leads Kresge, as you heard, and is one of the leading foundations stepping out on this issue of diversity and asset management. Um, but just by way of background, for you all to know who we are and why we got into this mm -hmm. work, ABFI um, was founded in 1971. We were founded as the Association of Black Foundation Executives. And our mission is to promote effective and responsive philanthropy in black communities. And we've got a membership of just under 1,000 around the country. And our work really falls into uh, two big buckets, if you will. One is ensuring that black talent and black leadership has the opportunity to lead uh, in the foundation sector in this country. So we're always pushing around um, diversity and ensuring that the C-suite in particular um, is in fact diverse and folks of African descent actually have the opportunity to lead. But we also are also um, very focused on how money flows coming out of foundations and the extent to which um, money is responding to the needs and the issues facing our kids, our families, our communities. Um, so in 2011, which was the 40th anniversary of ABFI, we began really to look at the uh, work of the organization to date and what was left to do. And again, always being a big proponent of issues of diversity and equity in the field really focused on the issue of diverse asset management. And I was telling Rip backstage, prior to coming to ABFI, I was with a very large foundation, good foundation in this country that does great work around kids and families, and I managed the work on diversity and equity there. And um, I used to say, this was about 12 <laughs> years ago, um, I could walk down the hall and know when I got to a meeting of the investment team, because it would be the only room, quite frankly, that was all white and all male, right? We were making strides as it related to diversity in the C-suite at that foundation, but mm -hmm. that one sort of team, that one portfolio um, was a tough nut to crack. So I bought that to my work at AbbVie when I got there 10 years ago. And in 2011, as I said, we started a body of work called Smart Investing. And um, we got into this work to really push for opportunities for minority and women-owned firms to manage foundation endowments. And we got into this work really for three reasons. Um, one, we knew that the data was on our side in terms of performance. And you all know the data, perhaps, um, that minority and women-owned firms perform as well and sometimes outperform other uh, investment firms and organizations. So we knew this was, one, about performance. Two, um, we are really concerned at AbFi about building and scaling black businesses in this country. There's a lot of research that suggests that if we focus on scaling black businesses, that's 
a real strategic way to address the racial wealth divide. And so if we were making ways for, for us, in particular, black investment firms to manage foundation endowments, we were actually building wealth mm -hmm. as it relates to scaling black businesses. Um, but the third reason why we got into this work around diverse asset managers is because we did a quick and dirty study of um, black investment firms in particular and saw that they were very philanthropic themselves, right? So when you looked at groups like Ariel Investments out of Chicago, you can't overlook you know, what John Rogers and the folks at Ariel have done around issues of education in Chicago and the south side of Chicago in particular. Um, if you looked in Baltimore and the work of Brown Capital Management, you, know, you have to recognize and lift up and really celebrate their philanthropy as well. So um, we thought this was another way, again, to build black wealth um, and also um, facilitate giving in our communities. Mm -hmm. So um, we really began to push in 2011, and over the past five years, um, we've been doing a number of things. We've created the sector's first directory on minority and women-owned firms, because as we talk to foundations and particularly investment teams in foundations about this, the first thing they would say is that we don't know any, right? So we wanted to take that sort of answer off the table and we created a directory that still lives on our website that we push out to our members mm. in foundations around the, mm. around the country. Uh, we created a number of papers over the last couple of years and Rip, when I look at the titles of some of these papers, it actually speaks to the challenge of this work. Um, mm. Investment manager diversity, the hardest taboo to break, <laughs> was the paper that we co-wrote with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation mm. um, in their work on this area. Another one was diverse managers Philanthropy's Next Hurdle, Who Manages the Money? How Foundations Can Democratize Capital. Mm. That actually is the case study of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation's yeah. work on diverse asset managers. So we're seeing some progress, some slow progress, but progress nonetheless, since we've been pushing on these issues for the last eight years. And one of the leading foundations is Kresge that actually has come out um, publicly and said that we're going to make this a priority for the foundation. Uh, Kresge was the first um, independent or private foundation to sign our diverse asset manager pledge that I'll talk um, a little bit about later. Um, but um, we want to dive into um, a conversation with Rip about why they took on this issue and what you're learning and, and how we get more people uh, mm -hmm. to, to join this movement. So. Um, Rip, I'm gonna just uh, start um, and not assume that people know just a little about Kresge. And if you could just share just high level about what's going on in the foundation, sort of your areas of focus before we dive in. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, Kresge is based in Detroit, which is why I'm wearing a suit. I didn't want to be mistaken for a <laughs> Californian. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and it was started um, in 1924 by Sebastian Kresge, who founded the five and 10 cent Dime, the dime store, essentially the precursors of Walgreens and so many other things. And, and over the time, it grew and grew and grew. It became Kmart. Kmart became too big for the family. They sold and created the Kresge Foundation. But we're based in Detroit. Uh, we work across the country. Uh, we have about $4 billion of assets, so we give out a couple hundred million dollars a year. And we focus on opportunity in cities, pretty much pure and simple, uh, whether that's in the realm of human services, environmental stewardship, um, health, community development, or the like. And we have also developed sort of side by side with our programmatic interest, a sort of a deeper and deeper commitment to social and, and impact investing, which is maybe the tie back into mm -hmm. the conversation tonight. Mm -hmm. And um, again, before we move to the work around diverse asset managers, I know, Rip, that Kresge also is thinking about equity broadly across the foundation, issues of diversity and equity. So I just wanted you to, by way of context, talk about that a bit. Well, it's hard to be a foundation focused on um, opportunity among low-income people in cities and not internalize as fully as you possibly can issues of racial equity, ethnic ec equity, and other forms. And so for the better part of the last four or five years, we've done what I think so many uh, institutions of our kind have, which has really gone deep uh, in three or four domains. One, we've tried to diversify our staff, about 40, 45% of our staff are people of color. Uh, we've sought to just learn a common vocabulary, begin to sort of understand what the issues are so they can be held across the enterprise. 
Um, we've begun to ask hard questions about vendors and contracting and how we can make sure they represent uh, the communities we serve. And we've, and we've also uh, done a lot of work trying to figure out how every program sort of elevates explicitly, even though it's implicit that we would always be focusing on people of color and low-income folks, but we actually explicitly sort of ask ourselves how our grant making and how our social investing advances issues of, of equity, opportunity, and justice. Well, we do a lot of uh, trainings and advising, as you know, mm. with foundation boards and staff. And I think we had almost half of your staff at <laughs> our last uh, training while we were in Troy, I'm glad in to hear Michigan. That. Yeah, no, <laughs> they were there. So, so on the issue of diverse asset managers, um, why is this important? <laughs> I, I was saying to Susan um, before we came on, I, I, I feel redundant because in many ways the case has been made so effectively through the course of the conference and certainly by the previous panel. Um, Rob Manila, many of you may have seen our chief investment officer yesterday made the argument, or whenever it was yesterday, I think made the argument that it's about returns, that when you diversify your managers, when you diversify your own staff, you make better decisions. Uh, and the, the, the evidence is crystal clear, as the previous panel was talking about. Um, and Rob wanted to make sure that I repeated that and repeated that and repeated that. So let me contradict him a little bit. Um, <laughs> my, my sense is that it is about returns. There's no question mm -hmm. that um, firms owned by women and people of color can return every bit as well as firms who are, are not. It just defies common sense to think that wouldn't be the case. But I, but I actually think that for an institution like ours, and institutions like ours are more and more common, committed to issues of social justice, social opportunity, it becomes crazy to have one part of your operation not be consistent with the rest of your mm -hmm. operation. Mm -hmm. And so the alignment of purpose around institutional purpose mm -hmm. has been really important to us. And I think third, uh, we have done what I think not quite as many foundations have done, which is to completely integrate our investment uh, team with our program teams. They serve on our committees, they help develop mm. strategies, we don't let them out of the building, we don't send them down the street, we don't let them work in New York, they've gotta be part of our ongoing infrastructure. And I think it's made a huge difference on both sides of the ledger. I think our program staff are much more sophisticated about markets and finance. And I think our investment team is much more attuned to the kind of work that the institution is trying to advance. And so it sort of comes more naturally, it seems to me, to them to think about the same kind of issues the rest of the foundation is thinking about. And we've got 105 employees, we're not terribly big, but 13 of those are investment professionals. And so it's really important to me that 15 percent of our staff beyond the beyond the bus you know that is actually a model uh, just for the sector you're right not many foundations do that at all there's this firewall between the program side and the investment side matter of fact I actually joined hmm. the the foundation that I worked for for many years because I wanted to learn how to grow and manage endowments and I was there for nine years and never once actually was in a conversation around investment management so just that one um, structural change that you're talking about is huge can That's I, huge. Can yeah. I jump the shark? Because I know yeah. you have a whole set of questions. Yes. And, sorry. <laughs> I actually think that in the philanthropic community, this is a very big deal. Mm. As we begin looking at mission-related investment more seriously, as we begin looking at the diversification of our portfolios, the hegemony that our investment staff has, uh, I think we need to step back and look at it. Um, it's... It, I. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard from my counterparts and major foundations in America say, well, I would do it except our chief investment officer won't let me do it. I said, say what? Mm -hmm. um, but often they report to a separate board. Um, the president of the organization doesn't have the right to sort of set the agenda, set goals, and do performance evaluation. It's all done by sort of classic investment standards of hitting your benchmarks and doing all of the things that a good investment set of professionals does. But again, we either are a single organization or we're not. And I, and I don't mean to be self-righteous about it. I get that people will have different models, but it just seems to me that as our society is moving toward a much more, I think, woke view of what it means to work in the 21st century, that sort of independent, hegemonous sort of relationship of investment officers by way of the rest of the, 
the organization doesn't make as much sense to me. Now I see why people are asking you to come around and talk. <laughs> Rip was just saying, people are asking me to come around and talk to their boards. Now I see why. Okay, because uh, I don't hear that that much. Um, Rip, 25 by 25. Hmm. Uh, you all an announced this campaign at our conference in Detroit a couple of months ago. Talk about the campaign. Well, I think it's one of the reasons I can't be too self-righteous is that we announced it two months ago, not 10 years ago. And uh, so I, I don't want to sort mm -hmm. of overstate it. But in some ways, it became um, uh, almost an, ine an inevitability. Um, we, uh, we are now at about 16% uh, managers of color and, and women managed um, funds. Um, moving to 25% doesn't seem that big a jump but it represents a level of intentionality that I think is really critical. And it happened for a couple of reasons. One, as I mentioned, we have a CIO who is deeply competent, committed, and, and fully aligned. Um, second, we have an organization that is fully aligned. But third, it, <laughs> we have an outside investment uh, group. Um, we walked into a, a room, uh, oh, I don't know, a year or so ago, and we had our whole investment staff sort of sitting along one wall. Twelve white men and a woman. And Myra Drucker, one of our great outside directors, looked and kind of tilted her head. And he looked, she looked at me and she said, that's just not acceptable. <laughs> she didn't even have to say the what wasn't acceptable. We all knew. <laughs> And I think for an enlightened CIO and for an organization committed to the work, it was sort of a tipping point. And Rob Manila immediately went to work trying to figure out how through internship programs, through more expansive pipeline development, through sort of different lens for um, manager selection, we could really go to work. And it, it, so it became almost um, a no-brainer to mm -hmm. say there is no reason in the world we shouldn't commit to 25% of our managers being managers of color or women by 2025. And if we can get there faster or increase that number, we will. Wow. How do we get more foundations, Rip, to get on the bandwagon on this issue? Um, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, one is I think some of our larger foundations need to use their voice, and some of them are. Mm -hmm. I mean, Darren Walker at Ford is a tireless advocate for this kind of work. He's got a difficult governance structure that makes it hard for him to move on some of this stuff, but Darren is out there all the time. Uh, Lejeune, Lejeune Montgomery Tabron at the Kellogg Foundation is way out on this. But I, I would argue that it can't just be our leaders of color. I mean, people like me have got to start talking about these issues, and more than talking about them, we've got to start doing something about these issues. Because I actually think it's it just, again, it's almost uh, insulting to think that somehow 99% of all assets under management have to be through firms that are white and male-led. I mean, in a 21st mm -hmm. century world, that doesn't make any sense. And so it just seems to me that uh, we just have to raise the issue. I think, uh, I think you can see it be being raised by mm -hmm. Abfi and Susan's work, but I think, I think we're slowly, slowly creating a critical mass. But we also need a bunch of proof points. We need to be able mm -hmm. to show at Kresge and at Ford and at Kellogg and in any case in a lot of other places that the returns are every bit as good and they may even be better than in our previous practice. That time went really, really fast, Rip. We were laughing about the time. Oh. So in closing, I just want to share <laughs> that um, we are actually, I mentioned the Diverse Asset Manager Pledge, and Kresge was the first private foundation to join on. We're about to roll this out into the foundation sector, and the pledge um, has five key points. And mm. I just, in, in closing, want to summarize. Um, one, we're asking foundations to make an organizational commitment to inclusive management practices, investment management practices. Two, to engage your board, investment committee, staff, and consultants in conversations regarding your commitment to diversity and inclusion. Three, require transparency and accountability from your foundation's investments consultants through regular reporting or on management diversity and inclusive practices. Four, actively engage diverse asset managers as potential partners and advisors through conferences, informal gatherings, and the like. And then fifth, to share your story publicly and specifically with AppFee, with your peers, as well as investment professionals. Folks, help me thank Rip and the leadership of the Kresge Foundation on this. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you, Susan. Thank you. <laughs>